Uh, run that through your mind again. Lord, prepare me to be a living place for you. If that doesn't make you do a little look inside, I don't know what will. I want to welcome those people that are watching on social media. Thanks for taking the time to do that. We'd love to hear from you. Our contact information is there for you to make use of. Our website answers a lot of the, of the questions that people have, and we're available to help with anything else that you don't find there. So we're currently focusing on the Gospel of John, and for the first time in a very long time, I'm actually using a text today that was included in the text last week. The text is John 3.16 3, through 3.21, and I talked about this briefly last week. Um, as I was planning out the series of messages, though, I evidently decided that I needed to talk about this again. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to read it, and then I'll explain why I now believe that I came to that conclusion. That t text discusses light and darkness, and it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. I'm going to do something this morning that I mostly shy away from doing. Uh, some of you are going to be glad that I'm talking about it. And some of you are going to understand why I am usually reluctant to do so. Uh, I'm going to talk about what Christians and the media around the world seem to be talking about. If you haven't figured it out yet, I'm going to talk about the Olympics. And specifically the opening ceremony of the Olympics. It, excuse me, is there anybody here who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Okay. I want to start by saying that I haven't seen the actual footage of the ceremony. And from the clips I've seen, I know I don't want to see the actual footage of the opening ceremony. The reason I'm mentioning it at all is because I believe that this type of exhibition is exactly what's written about throughout the Bible, and particularly even in our text today, I'll also say that regardless of the intent of the people who orchestrated the event, if you're not familiar, some are saying it was to mock Christians, others are saying it was to worship some Greek gods that they uh, had affection for. I'm telling you now, it doesn't matter. It was not godly. That's all I can say about it. The other thing I can say about it actually is Regardless of why they did it, they got the desired result. The world and the church took notice and is talking about it. The reason I usually hesitate to talk about it here is because I don't want to give the people and their actions the attention that they so desperately crave. The comment was made this morning, we should just ignore it. And I agree with that to a point, but we still need to be calling out evil as evil. Amen? There's something else I'll talk about later where ignoring it is concerned. But I want to address the situation through the lens of Scripture so that we are prepared to and able to react and respond in a way that is pleasing to God. That's my goal. I'll break down the text as I did last week and I'll do my best to find the best application for what we see happening in our world today. I'm also going to be reading some other scriptures that will go right along with this that are directly related. 
Like I said, I touched on these words last week, so some of this is going to sound just a little bit repetitive. I also want to say, uh, Billy, I would have left that microphone laying right there like you did, but I can't stand in one place that long. So, um, but it picked up fantastic, so good job. Um, so just bear with me on the repetition. Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Uh, Those of you who have been attending here for for a few years might remember the video that we've shown a few times of the children reading John 3.16. I didn't take the time to upload that on my new computer Um, They not only quoted John 3.16, but they ad-libbed as they were doing so. And they emphasized that God so loved the whole world. And that's a lot of people. Anybody remember that video? When they finished quoting that verse, one little girl said at the end, does anybody remember what she said? She said, wow. Just one word. That's how we have to read this verse. We have to read it with awe. And we have to understand that Jesus came and died for all people, including those who currently have Christians and the church and the media in an uproar. Jesus died for those people. I know we don't like it sometimes. That doesn't make us feel all warm and fuzzy to acknowledge that. But it's a fact. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. The whole world. That's a lot of people. The rest of this particular text, though, tells us that some will accept God's gift of salvation and some will reject it. And it also tells us why I said it last week and I'll say it again. Jesus is not condemning people. People are condemning themselves through their lives and their actions. When we look at it that way, it puts things in a different light. It says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. If you've heard me preach much, you know that I'm convinced by what I read throughout Scripture that belief in the name of Jesus is more than a reference to understanding intellectually that Jesus existed. It's a call to action in response to John 3.16 that God so loved the world. It's a response to that love. And the difference between simply knowing about Jesus and actually knowing Jesus is clearly outlined in the Bible as well. This is the verdict. I love that part of this verse. This is it. It's settled. The one in authority is giving the final verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. There's a word included in these two verses. I thought it was cool that you pulled out a single word out of what you were reading too. Uh, It's a real important word as far as I'm concerned. And it's the word fear. Jesus is the living light that has come into the world and the Bible is the written light that God gave us to light our way through this temporary life. Some people will avoid the light and some will openly deny the existence of the light and some will go as far as to hate the light. Why? Because they're afraid of the light. We hear a lot when we're children about being afraid of the dark. But it's adults, many of the adults in the world today, who are afraid of the light. They're afraid that the Word of God could be true.
they're afraid that Jesus will expose their sin. Here's something that you may not have considered. I would argue that based on what we see around us, that no one is concerned about Jesus exposing their sin to the world. People don't even try to hide it anymore. They're afraid of Jesus exposing their sin to them. To bringing them to the realization and the recognition that it is indeed sin. Because when you come to that conclusion in your life, changes must be made. Commitments have to be made. The enemy has emboldened people to live any way they choose. And yet they're afraid that their actions and lifestyle will be exposed by sin to they themselves. And when I say they, trust me, I'm including myself in that on certain days. Even though we're saved and freed from the grip of sin, we each have our own struggles. We battle those temptations because we've already been convicted by the Holy Spirit. The people that are out there just flaunting their sin have obviously not been convicted by the Holy Spirit. If we're honest with ourselves, we recognize the sin in our lives. If we don't, I'd suggest there's work to do for each one of us. And the funny thing is, and I'm saying funny strange, not funny ha-ha, but the funny thing is that we know we can't keep our sin from being exposed to God. And even though we know that, we do our best to keep our sin from being exposed to each other. Uh-oh, he's coming down on the church again. Even that's changing as some Christians acknowledge their sin and continue in their sin and claim forgiveness and salvation based simply on a knowledge of God. We talked about that in our Sunday school or our Bible study class. I sat and thought about this all week, and all I can say concerning the current condition of mankind, Chucky, is what a mess. What a mess. We live in the middle of a mess. I think just about anybody would agree that the world's in a mess. And I want to emphasize the word world, the word world as well. What we've seen during the last week makes it abundantly clear that the sinful depravity of mankind is not limited to any one location. The number of countries represented on the Olympic Committee, which is the group of people who approved of the opening ceremony, is huge. This is a worldwide phenomenon, a worldwide problem. Sin has always been a worldwide problem. Now I've come to the place in the message where I start to ask and attempt to answer questions. This is Nancy's favorite part. We want to attempt to answer them biblically. I'll start by asking, why are we surprised? Why are we surprised or even outraged at what we're seeing? Scripture tells us more than once that these very things will take place in this life. I've been known in the past to rely heavily on Romans chapter 1 when I make this point. The summary of that part of Paul's letter to the church at Rome is contained in verses 28 through 32 where it says this, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. 
They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Sin is on full display, church, and it's being applauded and approved of. We see it in the media. We see it in Hollywood. We see it everywhere. Romans, verse 25 of Romans 1 says that they've exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. Could that be the very bottom line of what's wrong with the world today? If it's not the very bottom line, it is definitely one of the issues. I find it kind of ironic, but by no means accidental or coincidental, that the very actions that we see from those opposed to the truth of God actually verify the truth of the Word of God. I don't have to defend the Word of God. The actions and the condition of our world prove the Word of God is true. And by the way, just as a matter of introspection, uh, you might want to go back and read that list right there. See if there's anything on that list you might need to work on. Because it's a pretty inclusive list. And it includes some things that we kind of slough off sometimes. We shouldn't be surprised by what we see, and maybe we're not. Maybe we're just outraged. That's the word I've seen on a lot of images this week. Christians outraged by the mocking of Christianity. Well, I understand that sentiment. After all, I just talked recently about Jesus being outraged at what he saw happening in the temple, I can't help but point out the difference between the two. Jesus was outraged with his people. We cannot hold the world to a Christian standard until they claim to be following Christ. Somebody in the Sunday school class said, well, what do we do? Turn it off! Don't watch it. I'm going to talk about what else we can do in just a minute. I'll admit my first gut reaction was anger when I heard about it and saw the little clip that I saw, but that quickly changed to something else. It quickly changed to pity. I feel sorry for those people. While the text I read from Romans makes it clear that they did at some point on some level have the knowledge of God, I can't imagine a single person who truly understands God's power and God's justice and God's love who would mock him straight to his face. I I can't imagine knowing what the outcome would be that somebody could do that. So I have to assume that they don't fully understand what the consequences are. Maybe because they don't want to. So I actually feel sorry for people who don't understand at least enough about God to fear Him. Yes, He loves us and His desire that is that none would perish. But Scripture also tells us that he's a jealous God. As far as the people that are concerned about him being mocked, Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8 say this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit 
will reap eternal life. We might be outraged. Our feelings may have been hurt by this and other attacks on our faith. But understand that God will not be mocked. This is temporary. We know who wins in the end. It may look like he's being mocked right now, but we know that for the mockers, shy of repentance, things add, end very badly. Everybody's going to reap what they sow. God will repay those who offend. We've talked about this also in our Sunday school, our Bible class. And most of you have heard me say it at one time or another. God does not need us to fight his battles. He needs us to reflect his son. That's what God needs from us. Into a world that has gone all the way down to the level that it's at right now. That's reached this level of depravity. There's a progression that we see in Scripture that I think we sometimes overlook. 1 John 1.5 tells us that God is light. It's easy enough to understand. John 3.19 in our core text tells us that in Jesus, the light has come into the world. Included in what we know as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is quoted as saying to his followers in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's our directive. Let your light shine. Let people see Jesus in us. And if we're to reflect Jesus into the world, our lives must shine light on Him and on the good news of redemption and salvation that are found in the Gospel. In that same chapter, Matthew 5, Jesus is again quoted, this time saying, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. I know that's hard, church. It's hard not to respond in kind to the people that persecute us the people that we consider our enemies. But that's not what we're told to do. We're told to love them. We're told to pray for them. What better result for the kingdom of God than for all those people in France right now to fall on their knees and worship Jesus? You don't think He can do it? I think He can do it. I think the church needs to be praying about it. Because I'm convinced he can do it. These aren't suggestions, folks. These are commands. Just as the sun and rain fall on the evil and the good, our prayers must be on behalf of those who love us and those who persecute us. None of this is unforeseen or surprising to God. We have to understand that. And he's given us written instruction on how to deal with it. All of these things, pray for them. Love them. That doesn't mean agree with them. That doesn't mean don't question them. That means love them while they are sinners in the same way that Christ loved you while you were a sinner. And let your light shine. We should have sang that song. I knew Nancy was thinking about it. Verse 21 of our text from John 3 says, But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done 
in the sight of God. So here's a suggestion. Let's live so that others can plainly see that we recognize that everything we do is done in the sight of God. And let's be light. Let's shine hope into the darkness through the message of the gospel. It's not our job to condemn. It's our job to call out sin. But I don't get to pick who goes to heaven, and neither do you. Let's pray for our enemies that they will come to repentance and salvation through obedience to the same gospel message that convicted us. People will reap what they sow. We're aware of that. I want to repeat what I said earlier. Those who oppose the gospel do so out of fear. Not fear of God, but fear of the truth about themselves and the consequences that may come from that. And I'm here to tell anyone who needs to hear it and everyone who can hear it that true love drives out fear and God loves you. Let's pray. God, we do love you so much. We thank you for your word. There are so many things in this life that the enemy uses to try to distract us from it and to try, try to get us to react in a way that's not pleasing to you. So I pray that we would be firmly planted in your word, that it would be our foundation, that our roots would grow deep in it so that when these things occur, we can respond accordingly. I shared with some people earlier today that I had a minister say to me that those people in France should die and go to hell. Father, I pray that is not what happens. I pray they hear from you, they are convicted by you, that our prayers allow your Holy Spirit to change their hearts, which will then change their destiny. And when that happens, we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise because we know it is only you who are capable of changing such hearts. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.